Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. Those who have been following along in December, all month long, we've been celebrating big cats. We've been talking to scientists, explorers, and conservationists all over the world who have been telling us about the threats big cats are facing, about their ecology, and of course, the very important work that they're doing uh, to conserve big cats around our planet. So we're gonna continue on today and we're gonna meet Vincent in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, I wanna give a quick little reminder as I see our viewers climbing on YouTube. Um, you can still get in on the action, use the YouTube chat sidebar, send in questions, let us know where you're watching from and we'll make sure we work some of those into our Hangout today. As well, any classrooms, whether you're live on camera or joining us uh, via YouTube, take pictures, post them online, use the hashtag Explore Classroom and uh, tag at Nat Geo Education as well. We love to see uh, classrooms in action. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be hanging out with Vincent today. Uh, Vincent uh, is the Cheetah Metapopulation Coordinator for the Endangered Wildlife Trust. He's been doing that uh, since 2011, overseeing the growth of the metapopulation from 217 cheetah on 41 reserves to 357 individuals on 55 reserves. So Vincent's also the recipient of the Endangered Wildlife Trust Conservation Achiever of the Year Award. And in 2017, he's the recipient of the South African National Parks Kudu Award for individual contribution to conservation. So Vincent, it's so great to have you joining us today. We're really excited to learn a little bit more about the work you're doing. And uh, of course, the students are gonna have some questions for you. Uh, thanks very much, Joe, for the opportunity to speak to you guys. I hope that my connection is sufficient. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the best background. I'm on my way to, to fly out to, to Iran, which is the, the place in the world where the, the last remaining Asian cheetah population occurs in that country. So sorry that I can't be uh, uh, speaking to you guys from the field, but uh, uh, let's uh, looking forward to sharing my work with you regardless. Um, Joe, can I go on to a screen share? Absolutely, yep. I'll tell you when it's full screen. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, is that full screen now? Uh, yeah, just hit uh, hit full screen on your side. We have the presenter view. Uh, oh, okay. there we go. We're good to go. All right, fantastic. Thanks very much, guys. Um, so, uh, my, as Joe said, my name is Vincent. I, I manage the cheetah meta population. So, just to get the boring stuff out of the way, um, how did we land up in this situation? Well, basically, if we look at South Africa, um, you know, the uh, European settlers arrived right in the corner at the bottom there uh, in the 1600s. And as they, uh, when they arrived, they brought with them uh, weaponry and horses and weaponry enabled them to shoot cheetahs out. And horses, even though they're not as fast as a cheetah, they definitely can run further than a cheetah. So this enabled the, the settlers to completely uh, wipe out cheetah populations pretty much across the country. And uh, by the 1930s, there were just two populations left in South Africa. Then a wonderful thing happened in our country in, the in 1994. Uh, de democracy came to South Africa. Nelson Mandela became our president. Everybody was allowed to vote. And uh, because of an improved political uh, climate, uh, a lot of tourists started flocking into South Africa. And these tourists wanted to see our animals. They wanted to see our cheetahs, our lions, our elephants, our rhinos. And the number of cheetah reserves increased from 10 to 55. So we reintroduced cheetah into all of these little dots that you can see on the South African uh, uh, map here. Uh, we put cheetah back into protected areas, into game reserves in those, in those areas. And uh, as a result of these efforts, um, you know, today South Africa is the only country worldwide um, with a growing wild cheetah population. Uh, our numbers are up from 500 to 1,200. And if you look at cheetahs in the world today, there's only 40 left in Asia, in Iran, uh, 250 in West Africa, 2,000 in East Africa, mainly in Kenya and Tanzania, and then uh, 4,500 uh, in Southern Africa, where I live and work. Um, so, so the main reason for this uh, um, population growth that we've seen in South Africa is that that's a right up. We've, we've we've realized that that um, cheetahs don't coexist well with sheep. And so, so we've erected fences all around our reserves to prevent the cheetahs 
from killing goats and sheep and cattle of farmers. And uh, so those fences keep the farmers uh, out of the uh, game reserves and they keep the cheetahs and the lions and the leopards out of the farming areas. And, and, and this uh, prevents conflict between farmers and big predators. So if you fly over Africa today, the picture on the left is what Africa looked like uh, two, three hundred years ago. The picture on the right is what you're most likely going to see. You know, there's been a lot of human population growth in Africa and, and the landscape's been completely transformed by human activities, by agriculture, by roads, by buildings and, and urban development and so on. And uh, it's no longer possible for the cheetah to move between the game reserves because they can't move through the landscape on the, on the right hand uh, picture. Um, and the bad news is that the human population growth is going to continue, um, you know, well in, into the next century and for at least the next 150 years, you know, the pop human numbers on, 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 on the African continent are going to double and um, they've already increased more than by more than 20 times in, in the last uh, uh, 200 years. So this is this is a big problem for our wildlife. And um, and that's where my job comes in. So so I move the cheetahs between the reserves to prevent inbreeding. So inbreeding is when a, a brother and sister produce children or father and daughter produce children. And there's reasons why inbreeding is, is banned in countries like South Africa, like um, the United States, like Canada, like India. Um, inbreeding is banned because it produces offspring or babies that are not healthy. Um, they, they always sickly, they smaller, they weaker. They look strange because they suffer from something called fluctuating asymmetry, which means they're a bit out of proportion. So there's reasons why humans are not allowed to uh, marry. You're not allowed to marry your sister or your or your father or your mom because it, it, it's not, it doesn't create healthy human beings. And the same applies to, to animals. So what I do is I move the cheetah between the reserves to prevent inbreeding. And um, we've learned a lot about a, a cheetah when moving them between reserves. We can move them across many different habitat types with different climate, different competing predators. You know, cheetah are the weakest of the big cats. They really don't compete well with lion, leopard, uh, and hyenas. And, and um, we move them from reserves like this in the Kalahari to a thicket reserves uh, where there's dense bush. As you can see, this is a lion chasing a cheetah in a thicket reserve. We can move them into Karoo semi-desert reserves where it gets so cold in winter that it sometimes snows. We can move them onto floodplain grassland reserves in the middle of Africa where temperatures reach up to 50 degrees. We move them into low felt savanna reserves where there's a lot of leopards and, and cheetah are not able to fight off leopards. They can run away from them, but they normally are not able to fight off leopards. And um, and then we can move them to grassland reserves and and to mountainous reserves and and even semi forest reserves. And no matter where we move them, we know that that cheetah on the back of my vehicle has got a fifty to sixty fifty to seventy percent chance of surviving at the new reserve because they're very adaptable animals and. Um, they very quickly find out what, what they can and cannot eat. Uh, the toughest cheetah that I work with are, occur in the, some of the driest regions of South Africa, in a place called the Karoo. And as you can see, this is a very difficult place for a cheetah. It's very rocky, so they can't really run at their full speeds in this kind of habitat. And they have to walk very, very far to find food in this kind of habitat. So when we move cheetahs into this Karoo region, only about 26% of them survive. But when we take cheetahs from the Karoo and we put them elsewhere, it's like Christmas because there's so much food. So um, we do this work because of the genetic rules. And, and, and for any mammal species, it doesn't matter if you're a whale or a mouse, for you to be genetically healthy, your population needs to be at least 1,000. And there's very few places in Africa where we have populations of cheetah that are that big. In fact, there's only one place. And um, I just thought I'd include uh, this slide, you know, so that you guys know uh, how tough it is to be a cheetah. The, the main killers of cheetah in, Af in, in, in the reserves that I work with are lion. Lion kill, 30% of cheetah deaths are due to lion, and 10% of cheetah deaths are due to leopard, 
Unfortunately, despite the fences, we still lose almost 25% of our cheetah due to human activities. Uh, poaching, snaring, cheetah are shot for their skins, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, cheetah kill each other, of course. The males fight a lot with each other, about 8% of deaths. And hyena kill about 4% of cheetahs, mainly the small cubs. Um, but despite the fact that cheetah are the weakest of the large cats in Africa, they really can do very well. And we've seen this when we reintroduce them into reserves where there's no lion, no leopard, and no hyena. For example, in this reserve, Mountain Zebra National Park, we started with one male and two females. And in just four years, we had 35 cheetahs. So you really do actually need to have lion and leopard there to control the, the cheetah numbers. Um, one of the things that we really try to fight in South Africa is the loss of wild cheetah to, to pet traders. You know, cheetah are not really dangerous like lions and leopards are, and therefore they desired as pet animals. They almost looked, you know, they kept in houses as almost like dogs. And, and, and this is not good you want to prevent because we know what humans have done to the wolf. Uh, 15,000, uh, in, in a process, in, in the space of 15,000 years, humans have turned the wolf into all the domestic dogs that occur. So all the house dogs that you guys uh, will be aware of, you know, at your homes and so on, their ancestors were wolves. And it took us, 50, human beings, 15,000 years to turn a wild, functional wolf into all these domestic dogs. So. Obviously, uh, the wolf will survive in the wild, but most domestic dogs won't. So, so when you domesticate an animal, you make it weaker and you make it friendlier to humans. And, and this is not what we want for cheetahs. We, want, we don't want our cheetahs to be bred so that they look different, which has already started. We basically want wild, functional cheetahs, which have, are doing what they've been doing for millions of years, and, and that's catching their own food, knowing what to do when they see, see uh, uh, lions, knowing what to do when they see leopards, knowing what to do when they uh, come across a smaller leopard and they can actually stand their ground and fight. And then I thought what I'd do is I'd just uh, uh, share some stories with you, just so that you have an understanding of what it's like to be a cheetah in the wild. It's a very, very tough existence. It's, you know, all the big predators are out there trying to get you if you see them early enough, of course, you're the fastest animal out there, so no one's going to catch you. But, but still, you know, you, you have to be alert the whole time. And um, this is a, a female cheetah called Ketsuiri. She, she had uh, three cubs. She lived on a reserve uh, where there were 24 leopards and, and 12 lions. And uh, these leopards and lions were always out there trying to kill her and her cubs. And... Um, it was amazing to watch her walk through the bush, you know, she was very vigilant, you know, always checking around her. And, but unfortunately, one day the lions did get hold of uh, Kitsuiri, they caught her and broke her back. And they killed one of her, her cubs too. Uh, but two of her cubs did survive and, and we put them into a boma, which is about the size of two tennis courts. It's a fenced area in the middle of the reserve where they protected from the lions and the leopards, or so we thought, uh, because we got this picture, this photograph here. Every day the lion pride would come and visit these two baby cheetahs in the boma. And the baby lions, as you can see from this picture, would actually break into the boma to try and kill the cheetah. So it's very difficult to understand why lions hate cheetahs so much. Why do they want to kill them so much? We don't really understand why, because lion and cheetah eat different sized animals. Um, but um, we just know that lion and leopard are just very aggressive animals, and uh, that's probably what it is. But um, so these lion visits were so stressful for the one young male cheetah that he died of something called capture myopathy. So the lions never caught him, but he just died of stress. And um, uh, his, but his little sister survived, and she was a real little fighter. And we waited for her to grow up until she was an adult, and then uh, we released her from the boma and. An hour after we released her, she caught a bushbuck. So she was a remarkable little cheetah, a real survivor. Uh, and uh, that sort of gives you an idea how, of how, what it's like to be a cheetah. And, and this is her, uh, a year after we released her from the boma, 
she produced some cubs of her own and uh, she's been a great mother um what i'm going to do now is i'm just going to read through some slides uh you may be interested on 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 on, on what we do how do we catch these cheetah when we need to move them uh, in most cases we use a vet which starts the cheetah with um uh, immobilization drugs which makes the, treat the cheetah go to sleep but sometimes some of the cheetah that we work with are really really wild and uh, we have to use other techniques to catch them so normally what we know about cheetah is they love a big conspic uh, a big tree in the landscape and uh, what they'll do is they'll scratch on the side of that tree we call it a scratching post and uh, they'll often uh, use that tree as a toilet and they'll sometimes climb into the tree and 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 do their thing on top of the tree and um and then what we do is we bring in the capture cages we bring in thorn branches and we pack that tree closed in such a way that the only way that the cheetah can get to his play tree is through the trap cage and then we learned from a zoo in chicago in america that cheetahs really really like the smell of calvin klein which is a perfume and uh, this works very, very well to attract the cheetahs to the traps. And uh, there you go, you have it. There you've got your cheetah that you were trying to catch. Um, so more recently, we, um, we uh, were in um, a very difficult situation. We had to catch four cheetah, but the habitat where we were working was, it had a lot of trees. So it was impossible to find the scratching posts with it, with the, 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 tre the trees that, the, that the cheetah were using as scratching posts. So we had to rely on camera traps and uh, this is the fence line of the reserve. So we put the camera traps on the fence line to see where the cheetah were moving. And then uh, we realized that they were actually escaping out of the reserve. And, and we realized where they were coming under the fence line. And uh, we, we, uh, we then put cage traps through the fence line and we put thorn branches uh, in such a way that we funneled the cheetah into the cage traps. And uh, as you can see here, we are, on one day we got a photograph uh, on our phones of a cheetah walking into one of the cage traps. And uh, we got very excited and we raced to go and uh, uh, get this cheetah out of the cage traps and to relocate him to a new reserve. And when we got to the cage trap, he had unfortunately, he was too strong. He actually broke the cage trap and uh, uh, bashed his way out of it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was very disappointing. And uh, But anyway, we kept the traps there and we continued to try and catch these four cheetah brothers and sisters. And you won't believe it, but in one day, we caught all four of them. <laughs> so it was really a wonderful day. Uh, we really wanted to celebrate, but we couldn't because of course, now that we had caught them, we had to immediately drive them to the, the new reserves, which were a good 12 hour drive. So a very long day as you can imagine um so just so that you guys know i i know that most of the classrooms that we are talking to are in the uh, in north america and uh, it's very interesting i'm sure very of you very few of you guys know that cheetahs actually originally come from north america and um so if we look at uh, the cat family they originally uh, come from asia and uh, they split from their closest relatives in asia about 11 million years ago and the first cats that ever lived were the big roaring cats, including the tiger, the lion, the jaguar, the leopard, snow leopard, and the clouded leopard. The next group of cats that came about were the bay cats. I don't know much about them except that they live in Asia. The first cats that moved into Africa were the caracals. There's three different species, uh, beautiful medium-sized cats. But then about 6 to 11 million years ago, when sea levels were very low, three different kinds of cat lineages moved into the Americas from Russia across a, a, a land bridge between Russia and Alaska. It's called the Beringian Land Bridge. And this included the ocelots, which are, I'm, I'm sure some of you guys would have seen, beautiful cats, the lynxes, including the bobcat, and also the pumas. So um, it's very interesting that the closest living relative of the cheetah is actually the puma. And um, so cheetahs actually evolved in North America. And this is why the second fastest land mammal, the pronghorn, still occurs in North America today. So the speeds that the pronghorn runs, 
Those speeds were attained because many millions of years ago, pronghorns used to be chased by cheetahs in North America. So, and this is a picture of what the North American cheetah would have looked like. Um, uh, uh, as you can see, slightly different, but it looks very much half like a puma, half like a, a cheetah. Uh, we don't know why cheetahs went extinct in North America, but we know that before they went extinct, them and the lynxes crossed back into North America, uh, where the largest cheetah that ever existed lived. Uh, sorry, they crossed back into Europe, my apologies. Um, and this is where the largest cheetah ever lived, the European cheetah. And uh, it weighed about the same, si it was the same size as a female lion and much bigger than a cheetah, as you can see here. Um, so just before we end off, I thought I'd uh, uh, share some, some pictures with you. Uh, we recently introduced cheetah into Malawi, a country where the species went extinct 20 years ago. Uh, we loaded four cheetahs into this aeroplane and we flew them all the way up to Malawi. Uh, as you can see, this is the fence line of the reserve, uh, the na natural habitat on the top part of the picture and the agricultural land on the bottom part of the picture. So the fences really do play an important part in keeping uh, the habitat intact and in protecting our wildlife here in Africa. And uh, this is the first wild cheetah back into Malawi. It was a very big moment for us, exciting moment for us in the project. And uh, it was quite interesting because all leopards, cheetahs, and lions had been completely, uh, 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 they, they'd been wiped out in this game reserve. So all the animals in this game reserve hadn't seen a big cat for more than 20 years. And they, they didn't even run away when, they, when we released the cheetahs in Malawi. Uh, so it was really, it was very easy for the cheetahs in the beginning to find food because the, the prey animals, the antelope were, were really, they didn't realize that this cheetah was dangerous. And it was interesting to see the baboons, you know, they were normally baboons sleep in a tree to hide away from predators, but they were sleeping on the ground at night because they hadn't seen a big predator in 20 years. So it was really interesting to see how, how this changed after we reintroduced the cheetahs and when the animals finally realized that, that this was actually something dangerous. Um, so just before we end off, I'd like to share a video with you guys um, on, on something quite exciting that happened, um, you know, a few, a few days ago. We released two new cheetahs onto a game reserve, and, um, and uh, not long after we released them, they, they bumped into a leopard. And um, as I told you before, a uh, leopard normally kill cheetahs. Um, but uh, this time there were two cheetahs and one leopard, and it was quite interesting to see what um, what happened. So here's the video. So uh, right after this video was taken, the leopard actually ran away and went and hid up in a tree. So it was uh, really, really uh, interesting to, to see um, that unfold. If it was one leopard and one cheetah, then I'm sure it would have been a very different story. But uh, I, I hope uh, that was interesting for you guys. And uh, of course, I just want to uh, thank the sponsors of our project, which include uh, National Geographic and a whole lot of zoos, all uh, in the, mainly in the United States, the Schofield Zoo, the St. Louis Zoo, the Columbus Zoo, the Species Survival Plan down in Texas, and all of our South African sponsors. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. All right. Well, thank you so much, Vincent. That was a great presentation. Thank you for sharing that with us today. And of course, a huge thank you uh, for the work you're doing. You're doing incredible work, and it's so great to hear about the successes that you're having. So thanks so much for sharing that with us today. Uh, thanks very much, Joe. Yes, yeah. Now our population is growing. Um, uh, we, we started on 217 cheetah. We're now on about 350, and we're finding more places to, to reintroduce them. 
so uh, uh, yes, it is. It is uh, very, very exciting. Um, uh, Joe, you're just going to have to uh, explain to me how I I need to switch the screen so that it's uh, not showing my my screen. Oh no, you're back. I see you. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can you see the classrooms? Can you see us? Yes, I can see you. Thanks. I can see you now. Perfect. Yeah. No worries. Well, let's get meeting some of our classrooms. Let's. Uh, Let's start off in Burlington, Ontario. So in Canada, we have a grade five classroom with Mrs. Anderson. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing grade fives? Yes! All right, go ahead. Um, in a cheetah's lifetime, how many um, reserves do they get sent to in, a, in their lifetime on average? So we only move the cheetah once, maximum twice. Um, Half of the cheetahs that, that I work with are never moved at all. But, um, but every second cheetah is moved at least once in its lifetime. And sometimes we have to move it a second time. So only, only once or twice. All right. Great question to start us off. Let's jump to our next group. So we have a group uh, joining us in uh, Bangalore, India. And they're with Mrs. Preet. Let me turn their microphone on and see how they're doing today. How are we doing, boys and girls? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for staying up a little later with us, and we'd love to take a question. Uh, hi, uh, um, I'm Ranjit. Um, how have the cheetahs' uh, uh, hunting and uh, eating patterns been affected by the establishment of uh, natural parks and protected areas? Oh, uh, sorry. Can you just repeat the, the, the first part of that question? Uh, yeah. Uh, how have uh, cheetahs' hunting and eating patterns been affected by the establishment of national parks and protected areas? Yes, this is it's quite interesting because when we move them between the different reserves, uh, they, they there's different kinds of prey, and and they have to learn every time when we move them uh, what they can eat and what they can't eat. So what we found is that they're very adaptable. You know, cheetah, are, they know that they are not big and strong like lion and leopard. So they know that they must go for the smaller prey animals and the medium sized prey animals. So they, they switch quite easily to, to, to new species when we move them to new reserves. So, so they, this is something that they do quite easily. They, they, they do sometimes make mistakes. So they do sometimes go for animals which are too big which include an adult zebra or an adult um, uh, 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 wildebeest. And, 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 and when this happens, we do unfortunately sometimes lose cheetah. Uh, we, the zebra can kick a cheetah to death and a wildebeest has very big horns, which it can use to, to kill cheetah. And we've also had a case where mm -hmm. cheetah have been killed by ostriches. Uh, very few people realize how dangerous ostriches can be. So. So the, the cheetah chain, they adapt their hunting style quite easily when we move them uh, between reserves, but there are a few individuals that we lose, unfortunately. All right. And so I just want to give a quick shout out to some classrooms on YouTube who are joining us. We've got classrooms in Wisconsin and Vermont, uh, Alabama as well. So welcome. Thanks for joining us. And we'll take one of the questions from... Uh, uh, online. And we have a fifth grader named Nolan. He's wondering... Uh, what other countries are working on cheetah conservation? So at the moment, uh, we're also working with uh, Malawi, where we reintroduced the cheetah. But the strongholds for cheetah conservation really are Namibia, Botswana, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, and Ethiopia. Uh, and unfortunately, there's there's only one country in West Africa, or, or one sorry, two can two or three countries in West Africa where they still occur. That includes Benin. Burkina Faso and, 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 and Niger. So, so there's still about 30 countries on earth where cheetahs still occur and every one of these uh, countries has, has, has um, people working on cheetah. And then of course there's countries where cheetah are now extinct. For example, in India, cheetah went extinct there in the 1950s. And hopefully someone from Mrs. Uh, Preet's class will help us uh, get cheetahs back into India one day. All right, future, future conservationists in the making, I hope. <laughs> All right, let's go to, uh, we're going to go to Duanesbury, New York. We have some grade fives joining us. Mr. Denap, 
Phyllis's class, and they are with Mrs. Wilkes in the library. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade fives? Good. All right, who's got the question? How long have you been saving children's food? Oh, sorry, I've got uh, my my connect, uh, my uh, sound is in, I've got a lot of people walking past me here. Do you mind uh, repeating that question? How long have you been saving cheetahs for? Oh yes, okay. So I've been uh, working on this project for seven years, um, and initially, you know, when I when I started working on cheetahs, our population was decreasing, um, and uh, you know, it was. I wouldn't say I was enjoying the work at the time. You know, you you put a lot of effort in, and the population decreases. And, and then eventually, uh, two years into the project, our population started to stabilize, and then it started to increase. And um, ever since that has started happening, I've, I've almost become addicted to this work because, you know, you, it really feels good knowing that we're contributing to, to, to creating safe space for cheetahs and to protecting cheetahs. And it's wonderful to see their numbers increasing. And I really hope that uh, many of you uh, will one day have the opportunity to come and visit us here in Africa and to see our, our wild cheetahs. All right, great question. Let's take a little journey. Let's go to Bowling Green, Kentucky this time. We have some high school students joining us with Mr. Hollis. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, Kentucky? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what besides relocation and fence reserves is being done to curb habitat loss for cheetahs in the wild? Um, sorry, can you just repeat that question one more time? Sure. Closer and slower. Um, what besides relocation and fence reserves is being done to curb habitat loss for cheetahs in the wild? Okay, so if I got you correctly there, you said what decides where we relocate a cheetah to, is that right? Yeah, she was, uh, what besides relocation and the fencing of reserves, what else is being done to prevent habitat loss? Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yes, so, so we have a, a number of techniques that are utilized to, to protect a cheetah. Um, we, in, in, in Turkey, they, for thousands of years, the sheep farmers there used to use a dog called an Anatolian to protect their sheep and these Anatolians would basically live with the sheep to, to the extent that they almost think they're a sheep and um, so so what we did in, in Africa is we brought some of these dogs from Turkey into Africa and uh, and we put them with the sheep and the goats to protect them from cheetah so these dogs are big enough to fight cheetah and leopard off they're not big enough to fight lions off but they they are effective for, for cheetah conservation. Um, apart from that, um, I'm trying to think what other methods we use to protect cheetah. Basically, we, we try to work with human communities to, to make them more tolerant of, of the presence of large predators and um, to, to educate them about the value of of cheetahs. You know, cheetahs in South Africa, as I mentioned, have very high tourism value. and and it's possible for communities to to actually, you know, get work from the establishment of uh, game reserves. Uh, we know that in South Africa, that game reserves employ more people than 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 uh, agricultural farms. So so we we've reached a stage in my country where it's actually more profitable to to have a game reserve than a, an agricultural farm in some places. And uh, this, this recipe is something that we want to see uh, moving out into, into the rest of Africa. So when you guys do one day come and visit, uh, visit us, you must know that you're helping us conserve uh, our cheetah because tourism is very important for, for conservation. All right, another great question. Let's jump to, we're going to go to Quebec this time uh, here in Canada. We've got some grade sixes with Madame Provencher. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade sixes? Good. Thank good. You. good. Very good. Hi. Sometimes, if you see Shira, are you scared for your life? For your life? Okay. <laughs> um, so, when I started this job, yes, uh, you know, it's a big cat. It, it weigh, it, it's bigger than a dog. It weighs up to 70 kilograms. Um, but but uh, after working with Cheetah for many years, uh, you will very quickly realize that 
they're not dangerous at all to humans. So, so, so well, to adult human beings. So, you know, if there's a small child or a very old person, then they definitely are dangerous. And the one time when I was working with Cheetah, I was walking with a friend who had broken his leg and he was walking with crutches. And immediately the cheetah realized that there was something wrong with this person and they became very interested in him. So, so yes, they, they, they do spot opportunities, uh, you know, so small young children, will, cheetah will be dangerous for them. Older people, uh, uh, cheetah will be dangerous for them and injured people. But for an adult human being, uh, they, they definitely will not attack. All right, let's jump over to Mrs. Metcalf's class. They're joining us in Salem. Uh, there are grade six students. Let me turn their microphone on. Here we go. How you doing, Mrs. Metcalf? How's it going, grade six is? Good. My name is Trudy. My question is, do you track the cheetahs after you release them in a new reserve? Yes, yes, uh, we definitely do track them. Uh, so about 30% of our cheetahs have uh, a tracking collars on them. And this is especially the ones that we move. When we move them to a new reserve, we put a collar on them because cheetahs are like a, just like a, any other cat. They have a homing instinct. So when we move them to a new reserve, they always just want to walk straight back to where they come from. It's almost as if they have an inbuilt GPS. And, and um, so what we, we do is we have to put a tracking collar on them to make sure that they don't escape and walk back to where they came from. So, so collars are very important uh, for, for, for that and also for ensuring that uh, they don't move, uh, uh, you know, into uh, uh, areas where there's a lot of farmers with uh, goats and sheep. All right. And our final live classroom joining us is Mrs. Logson's class. They're joining us from um, Kentucky as well, Bardstown. There are some grade seven students. And Mrs. Logsden, uh, you're just off of my screen, so I might need you to unmute for me. Uh, to ask your question, but let's start off by getting a big wave if you guys can hear me. Yeah, all right, that's positive. Uh, and then if you want to unmute for me, we'll steal a question. Um, thank you, thank you, Joe and Vincent. Sorry, we had uh, a little uh, te technology uh, interruption there. Uh, I'm gonna turn you over um, to Hunter Allison. Yes, um, in hundreds of years, how do you see cheetahs evolving with the climate change? Uh, so that's a, a, a quite a quite an interesting question. Um, you know, uh, cheetah have been listed as one of the species that will be impacted uh, by climate change, and uh, a lot of our reserves will become drier, and 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 um, uh, you know there will be a lot more de de desertification uh, over the next few hundred years with climate change. And this could actually be, you know, some people say it will be bad because there'll be loss of prey. And because the reserves are fenced, the cheetah can't move to more suitable areas. So we'll either have to move them ourselves or what, or what, we, what we'll do is we'll monitor them because, because we know that cheetah, unlike lion and leopard, don't need to drink all the time. Uh, they get enough uh, uh, enough hydration from the food that they eat. So, so, so this desertification could actually be beneficial for cheetah because the lion and leopard aren't going to enjoy it, but but the cheetah will definitely benefit from you know a, a loss. You know that their, their biggest competitors may dis may may disappear. So, so it could actually be good for them, but. Um, I do know that uh, it was listed at, as one of the species that is most threatened by, by climate change. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, species, the cheetah is something, an animal that doesn't have a lot of genetic diversity and you need a lot of genetic diversity to adapt to new conditions. So, so this is why it is uh, listed as a species that could be impacted by climate change. All right, and Vincent, I'll throw one more question at you from the online community before we sign off for today. And this is a, a quick two-parter. Uh, the first part is how long have cheetahs been endangered? And the second part is, has anybody in your family uh, ever been part of cheetah conservation? Uh, sorry, I missed your, the first question there, Joe. Yeah, the first part was uh, how long have cheetahs been endangered? And then the second part was about anybody in your family, have they ever been involved in cheetah conservation? Um, so, so how long have cheetahs been in? 
Oh, endangered. Endangered species. Uh, endangered. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, the North American accent uh, uh, is sometimes uh, difficult for, for me. Um, but yes, um, so cheetah have been endangered for at least uh, uh, 30, 40 years now. Their numbers have decreased from, from about 15,000 30 years ago to 7,000 today. So that's why they are now classified as, as endangered. And I was very lucky growing up in Africa. Uh, you know, um, that I grew up on an avocado farm very close to Kruger National Park, which is a massive game reserve. It's the size of a small country. And there were 400 cheetahs inside of that uh, reserve. So, you know, when we, we used to go to Kruger Park at least twice a year, and we'd, if we were lucky, we'd see a cheetah once every three years. So, so that's what really got me interest, interested in cheetah originally. But I don't have any uh, co conservationists in my family. My family were all teachers and farmers. So, so, so I'm my, myself and my brother. My brother works on wild dogs. Uh, we we are, are the first conservationists in, in our family. So, so yes, uh, and we hope to be for, for much longer. All right. Well, first of all, classrooms, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Your questions were awesome as always. I do want to just remind you that you can check out National Geographic. Uh, dot org uh, backslash education to see what's coming up on Explorer Classroom. And in fact, we have a big event coming up on the 19th at 9 a.m. Eastern with another big cat scientist, as well as we're about to announce an event on the 18th uh, in Botswana, where we'll go live to a field site. So keep your eyes out for those ones. Um, if you took any pictures, please post them on Twitter with the hashtag Explorer Classroom. We'd love to see your classrooms in action. Vincent, thank you so much for taking some time from your travel. Uh, to hang out with us this morning. You're doing such amazing work. So thank you for sharing that with the students and inspiring them today. And we can't wait to hear about uh, your latest adventure. Uh, thanks very much, Joe. And uh, thanks very much, guys. I really enjoyed chatting to you and uh, good luck with your, your future careers. And uh, hopefully we can work today, to, 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 together one day uh, in conservation. All right. And I'm just looking at uh, Madame Provencher's class. They're showing a picture of a cheetah. Uh, let me turn their <laughs> microphone on so you can... You can see their picture a little yes. bigger. Oh. Yeah, put the picture up for us, yeah. Brilliant. That's excellent, guys. Uh, very well drawn. And one day we'll get them back into India. All right. Here come the microphones. They're coming on. Everybody, nice and loud, say goodbye and thank you. And we'll sign off for today. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Vincent, thank you so much. Safe travels, my friend. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks very much.